Your eye care professional does not recommend LASIK procedure for you. So, have you considered EBO ICL? In this episode of OcuTalk, ophthalmologist Rex Hamilton tells us all about EBO ICL, the unique benefits, who makes a good candidate, how the lenses are chosen, and how it differs from other refractive procedures. Hello, and welcome to OcuTalk. Today, we will be speaking with ophthalmologist Rex Hamilton. Welcome back, doctor. Great to be here. Well, we are always happy to have you. Uh, for anybody who may not have seen one of your other videos, can you please tell us a little bit about your background and your specialty? Absolutely. I've been doing refractive surgery for more than almost, I guess, 25 years going back to residency. Um, I was a professor at Stein Eye Institute for 15 years and ran the refractive surgery center there. And now I have my own practice in Beverly Hills where we have a very sort of concierge level, um, customized approach to vision correction. Well, that is perfect because today we are continuing to talk about refractive surgery. Uh, specifically today, I was hoping you could talk to our audience about EVO ICL. What exactly is EVO ICL? So the EVO is an implantable lens that goes inside the eye that corrects uh, a wide range of nearsightedness and astigmatism. It is a remarkable procedure that has opened up refractive surgery to a, a, a larger range of patients. Um, and it has some unique features that, that contrast with the cornea procedures, SMILE and LASIK. And so I think we're gonna kind of get into that and, and talk about what the advantages might be with for the EVO ICL in certain situations. Yeah, let's do that. What what are the unique benefits of EVO? What makes it different? So again, we're talking about nearsightedness here, and that has to do with something that you're born with, and that is a long eye front to back. And so the light doesn't come to a nice focus on the retina, it focuses in front. And the the, the way we've typically treated nearsightedness with refractive surgery has to do with reshaping the cornea, which is the structure on the far left. That's the window on the front of the eye. If you touch your eye, you're going to touch your cornea. That's where the contact lens sits, right? And so what we do with SMILE and LASIK is we take that curvature and we make it flatter. And that, that moves that focal point back to the retina and you're seeing well without glasses, okay? The issue is we only have so much tissue to work with. So if we look at the cornea a little more closely, you know, we see that there's a thickness there. And, and it turns out that everyone's cornea is a little bit different thickness. Some people are really thin, some people are really thick. And so we start out with a very detailed measurement of what that thickness is. Now, depending on your level of nearsightedness, I have to take off more or less tissue to correct that. So let's say you're minus one, I have to take off very little tissue to change the curvature appropriately. If you're minus nine, I have to take off a lot more tissue. So at some point, I don't have enough tissue to work with, okay? And that means that LASIK and SMILE are not an option. And patients come in and they're really sad when I tell them that. Except that now we have a different solution and that's where the EVO ICL comes in. And the EVO is unique in the sense that we're not doing anything to the cornea. We're actually placing a lens inside the eye. And it goes in that space right there. I'm gonna do that one more time so you can see. It goes in behind the colored part of the eye, which is the iris, and in front of the natural lens of the eye. The procedure takes literally about four minutes to do each eye. The patient's in the operating room for about half an hour uh, because we have to switch instruments between the eyes. We have to load the lens into its inserter. But start to finish, literally about half an hour to, to do the procedure. The patient's seeing out of the eye immediately, just like LASIK and SMILE. And now I'm able to correct, believe it or not, up to about minus 16 to minus 18 level of nearsightedness. 
And this is revolutionary and, and uh, actually has really changed the face of, of refractive surgery. The, the ICL has been around for actually 20 years. I, I did my first ICL surgery in 2005. There have been different iterations and, and the Evo is the newest version. And the difference, the main difference in the Evo is you, can you see that little tiny opening in the center of the lens implant there? Okay, that's the new feature with the Evo. And that that opening, although it looks really small and inconsequential, is very significant because it allows for a more natural fluid flow inside the eye. And that's healthier for the, the natural lens of the eye. And so uh, before we had that, I would have to do a separate procedure using a laser to make a little opening in the iris. And then I would have to do the lens implant. So it was it was a longer process. You know, making the little laser opening in the iris was a little uncomfortable. That's all gone. The little opening in the center of the Evo takes care of the fluid flow. And it's really kind of, opened up this procedure to sort of more, more patients. So speaking of who is the ideal candidate for this procedure? Great question. So we're typically looking at folks that are, are under 40 or maybe, maybe around the forties, but typically under 40 um, who have a level of nearsightedness, in my opinion, above minus six, I think makes sense to actually use the Evo. Below minus six, we, we do like the smile and LASIK procedure um, because it's very straightforward. Uh, you know, we're reshaping the cornea in a way that is optically, you know, makes sense. When we start getting above minus six to do LASIK and smile is definitely a good choice, but we are changing the shape of the cornea more dramatically when we move above minus six. And so that can have some effect on the nighttime vision, but more importantly, it also can have an effect on procedures we might be doing down the road. So we have another series uh, or lecture in this series about refractive lens exchange, which is for patients who are kind of 50 and older, where we're replacing the natural lens of the eye with an implant. And, and so, we need to be cognizant that these procedures we're talking about, Evo, LASIK, SMILE, they're not for the rest of your life. So we have another procedure down the road that we're gonna wanna do, and we wanna have the best compatibility of the optics of the eye for that situation. So for me, when we get above minus six, I love the Evo procedure, and you know why? Because when you need an RLE, I'll do this. I'm going to take the lens out. It's reversible, right? So now at this point, I've removed the Evo. I've done nothing to the cornea. The cornea is the natural shape, which is, is really a great shape optically. Now I have all options available to me when I'm going to do the refractive lens exchange, which is replacing that natural lens with an implant. And that comes later on. So again, when, when we're thinking about someone in their 20s and 30s, and I'm gonna get them out of glasses for 20 years, there's gonna be another procedure down the road. And the Evo is really a wonderful choice because it's reversible. And now I sort of have a fresh eye that I can uh, provide many different options for. So outside of having another procedure, outside of perhaps doing an RLE procedure later in life, are there any other uh, circumstances in which you would remove the lens? Uh, very rare situations, the, 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 the lens may be, uh, the sizing may be off. So when I say size, I'm not talking about the power of the lens. I'm talking about the overall length. So you see, you know, from top to bottom, there's a, there's a length there. The lens comes in four different sizes, okay? It's my job to figure out what the best, the perfect size is for each individual eye. Each eye is different, right? We have very sophisticated ways of imaging the eye to determine that, but it's not 100%. There's about a 2 to 3% chance that the lens is not the perfect size for the eye, and we want to switch it to a different size. So 
outside of, like we said, down the road for the refractive lens exchange, that would be a reason uh, to to exchange, which again, underscores the point. It's a reversible procedure and, and we can change the lens. How do you select which lens to use? So the, the, you talk about the sizing or the, so there's two things with the Evo. There's the size and there's the power, right? How nearsighted is the patient? So the power is very straightforward. We, we measure as we would for glasses, um, you know, which one's better, one or two. We do that a few different ways. And then uh, we have formulas that we use to tell us, this is the power for that prescription that should go in this eye. Very straightforward. For the sizing, we measure some of the dimensions of the eye. And then we have, again, some formulas that say, this is the right size for that sort of, you know, different powers, or excuse me, different measurements of the eye. So we have the size of the cornea, the width of the cornea. We have, we have how deep is the front part of the eye. We put all of those numbers into a, a, a formula, and then that will say, this is the size that we should use. It's not 100%. Well, I guess it's a good thing that it's... Uh something that you could always swap out if it wasn't 100% the first Absolutely. time. I tell patients there's about a 2 to 3% chance that we would need to do a swap. Okay, so I'm a patient and I've decided Evo ICL is the right procedure for me. What do I need to know in advance? How do I prepare? What's my pre-surgical regimen look like? It's very similar to what we would do with smile and lace. If we want you out of the contact lenses for a few days, um, no no eye makeup, no perfumes on the day of surgery, but that's really just about it. Uh, you know, we, there's really not much else that, that needs to go into the preparation. Um, I should, I do want to mention one other point, and this is fairly rare, but uh, the front part of the eye is the distance between the cornea, which you see in a cutaway here, that window on the front and the, and the iris and the lens. That area is called the anterior chamber. It's, it's a space that's filled with fluid. That has to be deep enough to support putting this lens in. And there are situations where, unfortunately, folks don't have a deep enough chamber, so we can't use the lens. That's pretty rare. Again, it's probably around, you know, 2 to 3% as well. Um, but again, we have to have the accurate measurements to look at that preoperatively. So the, the pre-op um, exam is very, very important. Uh, well, tell us a little bit more about the pre-op exam. Uh, walk us through how that would work. So we, we're gonna measure the glasses prescription uh, two different ways, once before and once after dilation drops. And the reason we do that is that we, we wanna take away the ability of the patient to focus. Some of the young folks in their 20s, they, they can just power through and focus. and you know, you can maybe give them too much minus prescription. So we want to not do that. So that's why we measure it both ways. The other thing we do is, is very detailed imaging of the anatomy of the eye. Um, like I mentioned earlier, the distance between the cornea and the lens, the width of the cornea, which we call the white to white measurement. Uh, all of those things are very, very important to figure out not only the power of the, the lens, but also the sizing. So now maybe could you tell us a little bit about the recovery for this procedure? What does the timeline for that look like? So the day after the surgery, the, the vision is excellent. We do need to see the patient on day one because we want to measure the eye pressure. Occasionally, we can have pressures that are a little bit high on day one. And that's because during the procedure, we're using a, a gel material inside of the eye to kind of maintain space, and then we remove it at the end. Occasionally that gel will kind of get a little bit stuck in the drainage system of the eye for a day. So we wanna make sure that we're measuring the eye pressure um, on day one. Um, the restrictions are similar to LASIK in the sense that we don't want any water in the eye for a week. Um, we do have patients you know, wear a shield over the eye at night for a week when they're sleeping. And no, no eye makeup. I say for a week. I don't know that I always get a week, but you know. So we want to be just careful with the eye. We want to obviously avoid you know, any risk of infection while it's healing. Are there any uh, side effects specific to this procedure that patients need to be aware of? Yes, and it, you know, 
basically when you're doing any of these procedures, it's kind of like getting a new glasses prescription or switching between contacts and glasses. Your brain is more aware of your vision when you do those things. And so here, of course, we, we are changing the optics pretty dramatically very quickly. And so there's a period of adaptation that the brain goes through. One of the things that folks will notice is because of that small little opening in the center, they, they will report a slight halo around lights at night. Uh, you'll also notice that the optic is that central circular area there. That's where the light is, is being focused on the retina. The pupil can get larger than that in some patients, uh, particularly in dimmer light. And they will notice a little bit of a shimmering effect in the, in the bottom part of their vision when there's overhead lighting. Those kinds of things are, are very common. And again, the brain adapts to that very quickly and just kind of ignores those things over time. Well, is there anything else specific about Evo ICL that you would like to tell our audience about today? I really, really like the Evo in folks that are approaching 40-ish, okay? Because what happens with the eye as we get older is that the natural lens of the eye, I'm going to come back to our picture from the side, the natural lens of the eye is the structure behind the colored part of the eye, that oval-shaped structure. That's what allows us to focus distance and up close. Unfortunately, we lose that ability to focus as we get older. And so somebody who's, who's close to 40 is closer to the point where they've lost their near vision than somebody in their 20s. So as I mentioned earlier, we have a great procedure to fix that. It's called refractive lens exchange. So if somebody's kind of late 30s, maybe slightly early 40s, and they want to fix their vision for distance, I love the EVO procedure because I know that in somewhere between five and 10 years, I'm going to want to do the refractive lens exchange. In that situation, I can just take that lens out and we're sort of starting fresh. So it's a really, really great procedure in that age range as well as for anyone who is over about minus six in terms of their nearsighted prescription. Well, thank you very much, doctor, for uh, walking us through this procedure today. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us before we go? I think the, the really important aspect of refractive surgery is it's not a one size fits all. You know, we have these three great procedures that have their own unique sort of advantages. And Given the demographic, you know, what's the age of the patient? How high is the correction? We really want to choose that procedure that fits that profile best. So I would suggest that a patient who's looking for refractive surgery, make sure your surgeon is, you know, uses all these procedures so that you are going to get the best procedure for your particular situation. Well, thank you very much for joining us again today. Thanks so much for having me.